morning, everyone. Uh, so um, many of you already know me. I'm Jula Pajak Kiani at Philadelphia Fed. So uh, I'm excited to moderate this uh, very interesting session on the roles of uh, big tech in financial services. Uh, So I'm so excited, I make my own slide. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, so this session, <laughs> so this is just to give you an overview of uh, what we are going to talk about. So there's three themes here, and I won't take too much time, but uh, what you see on the left bottom is the cloud, right? So uh, we see, heard a lot so much about how big tech has become so big and getting into uh, financial services uh, and the one thing that they have been doing and uh, have been causing a lot of concerns uh, among regulators and uh, in Washington, uh, cloud computing service. A lot of banks are maybe using, moving data and computing into cloud. So uh, we have two great speakers to talk about that. And also uh, big data and AI and how we know that big tech has been collecting a ton of data, consumer data, so they can use the data to, uh, to, act to provide financial services uh, like insurance and uh, risk management, asset management, and also lending. And the last theme is uh, what's going on in China. So we have a Chinese fintech expert here as well. And the picture that you see here uh, are two beggars with a QR code next to them. Uh, so everyone in China now is using uh, e e-wallet, right? And so the two, two main uh, currencies that they're using are basically uh, from uh, WeChat, which is like Facebook here, and, uh, and Financial, which is like uh, Alibaba, which is like Amazon here. So, uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, introduce the four awesome speakers. The first one is uh, going to be uh, uh, Lou Goodwin, who is the president and CEO of Square Financial Services. So uh, last year, I said, I said we talked a lot about how banks are using data, big data, AI, ML, to, uh, to make loans. But now we're seeing that actually, uh, rather than seeing fintech disrupting and causing banks to fail, we are seeing that uh, some fintech lenders are applying to become a bank, right? And Square is one of them. So Square is applying to be an ILC, and so if it is approved, uh, Lou will be the CEO of that bank. And so we are happy to have him here. One thing is that Square may not sound like a big tech, but uh, it shares the same CEO and co-founder as Twitter. So, uh, so that makes it more interesting. So the second uh, speaker would, uh, is uh, Stuart Breslow. We are, uh, it's an honor to have him here. I don't know if I'm pronounced it correctly. <laughs> uh, so he is uh, head of financial service uh, industry vertical at Google Cloud, in charge of all the Google uh, Cloud service uh, to financial uh, institutions. And previously, he was uh, chief compliance officer at Morgan Stanley and also served on the man management committee at Morgan Stanley. So it's, uh, it's great to have him here to talk about, uh, and Google is one of the five largest uh, provider on this. Then the third speaker is Professor uh, Hal Scott from Harvard Law School, a prominent professor who has written many influential articles. And the most recent one is on how to regulate cloud computing. So, uh, re uh, so we, we are, it's an honor to have him here to talk about uh, how, how to think about uh, regulations because it's uh, obviously while it has provided benefits, it comes with new types of risk and creates uh, more complexity in the trade-off that regulators should be thinking about. And lastly, uh, we have uh, Martin uh, Kosenpa, who uh, is a research fellow at the Peterson Institute. And uh, he, not only doing research on uh, Chinese fintech, he has written, uh, written a book and also uh, work in China, speak Chinese, he uses Alipay, and uh, so it's uh, very nice, and he actually can read all the news that we can't understand, so uh, it's nice to have him here. So I will start with uh, 
the first paper. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, again, my name is Lou Goodwin. I'm happy to be here. I uh, appreciated the uh, early comments by Charles. That was uh, a great lead-in to, uh, I think, a, a great conference. And uh, as uh, Jalapa talked about, uh, we wanted to uh, talk about what is and, and why we started Square and Square Capital. And it's, it's really simple. It is economic empowerment to be able to bring people into the economy and into the banking system that really had been uh, shut out before. And if you look at uh, what a small business has to deal with on a daily basis, it, is, uh, it comes with enormous challenges. And, and, it, and when you look at small businesses, they make up 80 plus percent of the economy of the United States People uh, from sole proprietors to uh, small employers have uh, not only a skill or a product or a service that they provide, but then after they've provided that, they have to figure out how to handle uh, the cash, how to handle the processing, how to handle payroll, how to handle uh, all sorts of analytics that would come with that IT. So the challenges are, uh, are endless for them, and, and a lot of the, uh, the possibilities that people had uh, of getting services uh, were, were limited, uh, especially uh, where, where we looked at Square coming into and, and starting uh, a lot of the, the payment processing is that it, it started from our founders who, who uh, one, uh, a glass blower and an artist and a designer, and, and putting that to, uh, to finding and selling their art. And they could not sell their art because they were unable to take a credit card payment. And, and so uh, people would walk away and, and the sales would not be made. And uh, so getting together with, uh, with Jack Dorsey, uh, an engineer, and Jim McKelvey, who is now an independent director of the St. Louis Fed. In St. Louis, they came up with a way to use the frequencies in the cell phone to take payments. And, uh, and it started back there in 2009 and has, and has evolved greatly to, to what we see at Square as a number of solutions. I, I, I won't go over those, but, but certainly there are a number of uh, things that help a small business uh, be able to cope with and analyze what it does on a daily basis. Certainly, uh, tech is making it easier uh, for, uh, to start a small business and, and to keep it going. And uh, our, we are best known for the, uh, the point of sale and the payment processing services uh, that we provide to millions of small businesses today. Uh, tech is also uh, making it easier to run a small business. Uh, and and uh, one of the things about Square is that while uh, we provide a service and, and uh, we certainly charge for that service, uh, we, we charge for it at a very simple rate that is easy to understand. Uh, there aren't minimums, there aren't, uh, there aren't uh, large investments. Uh, again, you can uh, take these payments on your phone uh, or you can uh, buy point of sale. But, uh, but what we also provide with that service is analytics, is that we have a, a lot of information uh, about 
the payments you take and the, and the more that you want to involve and put in SKUs and other things, you can have a, a deep set of analytics that lets you compete with uh, larger companies and makes you uh, more viable uh, on, a, on a daily basis and on, a, on every sell basis. And one of the things that, uh, that we saw after uh, we started providing the payment processing was access to capital. So uh, it was really a point where, where small and micro businesses uh, were, were really just n not included in the economy that way unless you could provide for that uh, through your individual credit uh, profile. And so uh, this slide really talks about looking at uh, a, a 2014 article from Forbes, and that's, uh, that's about when Square Capital came about, is to say, look, uh, you know, it is a FICO-driven system that is mainly focused on the individuals, and, and these are small businesses. These, uh, uh, in, in many cases, uh, the people that have started small businesses have extended their own personal credit and gone to the bank of the friends and family, and that bank gets tired pretty quick. Uh, but, it, but it also uh, makes it so that if you look at past performance, that may not be reflective of what the business does today and how viable the business is. Uh, uh, also, a, a, a barrier was a high minimum for loans. Uh, a, a lot of small businesses just didn't fit that profile. Uh, and it was very uh, confusing and uh, in, in its uh, terms and conditions and uh, had many hidden fees and certainly a lengthy application process. If you look at uh, you know, some of the uh, studies that came out uh, from the 2015 small business study from the Federal Reserve, it's that there was only a 54% approval rate uh, that was provided for micro and small businesses. And 35% of the people felt like uh, they were discouraged from applying or, uh, or essentially told ahead of time that it, it may not work out for you. Also, uh, 24 hours plus to fill out the paperwork for a, uh, a commercial loan uh, at that time, uh, very difficult. And even after that, 63% uh, of the people that went through it or the businesses felt like they still had a shortfall of what they, uh, what they asked for and what they uh, actually got. So uh, the challenge for Square Capital when we started was to, uh, to hit these uh, elements uh, that we worked into uh, to our product, which is to make it fast and convenient, to make it so there's no hidden fees, that, uh, that as you uh, sign up for that deal, you know exactly how much you would pay, no, uh, no additional fees or charges that would come about, <clears throat> and then you would pay at your pace, and you would pay from your payment from your daily payment processing that you have with Square and that we looked at that as very much of a partnership. When we uh, uh, started into uh, Square Capital and, and started lending, we found that 77% 70 of the people that we lend to, this is their first time that they have ever uh, been able to receive uh, capital or funds for their business. And our loan sizes uh, uh, are, go from $250, not $250,000, $250 to $100,000. So uh, that is a wide uh, dispersion there. But uh, when you look at our average size loan, it is six to $7,000. It is the lifeline for a lot of small businesses to be able to, you know, uh, fix that freezer that goes out to be able to, uh, to, to buy inventory for, uh, for the holiday that is coming up or whatever it is. It is, it is certainly helped businesses sustain and grow and, and that is truly, uh, I think, uh, helping uh, economic empowerment uh, across the board. And we've been able to do that with a uh, less than 4% 
loss rate. And the way we've been able to do that is that we use proprietary data, machine learning, and artificial intelligence of the payment processing uh, that goes on with us down to the, the payment that, th that they take down to uh, the, the item level. And so we have a tremendous amount of data. And we've been able to attract investors uh, who uh, help us uh, move more uh, loans through the system. And, uh, and it has been a very attractive uh, area for them as well. So to date, uh, we have, uh, uh, over the last four years, uh, we have lent out uh, or uh, extended financing through Square Capital of $5.5 billion. And the process, as we talked about, is uh, simple, fast, and, and transparent. Just to quickly go through that uh, when, when we look at the processing and we, and we review it on a daily basis uh, of, of our entire client base and seller base, uh, we determine that based on uh, the heuristics that we have had and the signals that we see, that we are going to offer credit to you. And you have a selection to make, and it's very uh, straightforward and simple. You can pick a different amount and different hold rates that you would have that uh, fit into your business profile. And uh, you have a slider that you can move up and down to understand how much of the daily card sales it would take, uh, and then your estimated payback period, and a flat fee. Uh, and, and so you know uh, that, you, uh, that if you borrow this $10,000 this time, your flat fee in this case would have been uh, $1,050. And then you would pay that back uh, over uh, uh, your daily processing. So for example, it's very flexible from the fact that if you happen to uh, you know, go on vacation for two weeks or, uh, or an extended period of time, there are no payments due. There is only a minimum payment due every 60 days as opposed to a, 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 a usual 30-day period. And so uh, if you don't process, you don't have a payment that day, but it comes out right from the, the proceeds that you would process with Square. Uh, the account information that you uh, uh, need to provide us is very, again, straightforward, uh, and it's not a, a large application process. It's, it's a lot of the information that we can pull from the records that we have with, uh, with Square already and, uh, and a minimal amount of time that is required to take that. And um, my last slide, and I, I, I think this is, uh, we're uh, very excited about this, uh, this finding is that, look, we, we serve businesses across the U.S in both uh, urban and rural communities, many of which in the rural communities have lost their financial institution uh, because the, the branching is not economical for uh, traditional banks. Uh, but when we have done uh, some studies of uh, our, our customers that we have lent money to, uh, we have found that 58% of the proceeds have gone to women-owned businesses. And that compares to 17% in the SBA studies that, uh, that are out. And uh, also 35% have gone to minority-owned businesses compared to 27% in those same surveys. So uh, again, thank you for your time, and uh, I will uh, turn it over to, the, to Stuart. Good morning. I'm Stuart Breslow. Um, before I get started, uh, every speaker's nightmare is a Wall Street Journal story about your company um, <laughs> before you get up to us to speak. Um, happily, it was yesterday, not today. Um, so just to give you some, some views on it, um, Google is not going into banking. I think there's a huge sigh of relief in the, or in the audience. Um, what we are doing is we're partnering with banks to provide a platform for checking services. And, uh, and, and it's an extension of the, the, Google Pay, the Google Pay platform at this point. 
which is what we're doing. So we have no intention of going to banking. We're not competing with banks. We are a service provider to banks. And that's the role we've carved out for ourselves in the cloud. Um, I've, as you heard before, I was at Morgan Stanley basically forever. I've been at Google Cloud now for a year and a half. First time I've worn a tie in a year and a half. Um, <laughs> Julapa insisted I had to wear a tie. Um, so there, there's that. Um, also, I, as she mentioned, I'm awesome, a word I never heard in my Morgan Stanley career, uh, but I hear every day at Google Cloud. Um, in addition, I've learned to use exclamation points. You have to use at least three exclamation points in every email to actually be part of uh, the, technology, uh, the technology world. Um, so um, I've been asked to speak today to provide an overview of the cloud computing and financial services in 10 minutes or less. Um, I'm never quite sure of the sophistication of the audience that I address on this stuff. So for those of you who get it, I apologize. For those of you it's new, um, welcome. The, we've, we've made presentations to very senior people, gone through the presentation, and then gotten questions that just don't make sense. So a little bit of it is baselining it and making sure everyone's on the same page. Um, in my a lot of time, I want to do four things. Um, first, what's the cloud? Second, what's the intersection of the cloud and financial services? Third, what are the opportunities for the cloud and financial services? Or perhaps more appropriately, what are the opportunities for financial services in the cloud? Fourth, what are the challenges for the cloud in financial services? Um, I've been w warned and reluctantly agreed that this is not an advertisement for Google Cloud. Um, but if you want to see me afterwards, no, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. So first, what, what uh, let's see. So what is the cloud? Um, in its simplest form, in its simplest terms, the cloud is a massively scaled set of data centers that are made available to customers through a variety of contractual arrangements. For the uninitiated who are looking for some ethereal cloud thing, that's not it. The cloud has very tangible manifestations in data centers that are distributed globally. Um, as you can see from the slide, Google Cloud is indeed very tangible with 134 points of physical presence linked by hundreds of thousands of, fiber optic ca of miles of fiber optic cables that we own and we've laid them ourselves. They, it's, a ver it's a dedicated network of data centers uh, linked by, by cables that we own. Um, it's estimated that 25% of global internet traffic flows over our network in a given day. So Google Cloud is using the Google infrastructure. Google Cloud provides the infrastructure to Google. 25% of the world's um, internet traffic flows, over, flows through Google every day. So when you get your 0.0001 second response to your query, that's all being covered, that's all happening on the Google Cloud. Um, we use the very same infrastructure for the cloud that, that Google uses for search and ad. And many of you have touched the architecture of Google Cloud. Um, there are eight Google apps that have over a billion users. Um, I expect if I ask for a show of hands of Gmail accounts, I would see people who have at least one, thank you. Um, <laughs> I hope there's more than one. <laughs> and I would see a lot, of, a lot of Gmail users, but also YouTube, uh, Maps, Chrome, Search. And by the way, just in case you're wondering, Waze is owned by Google. So when you think you're getting something different, it's the same thing. <laughs> but, but Waze and Google Maps are the same thing. Um, uh, apart from Julapa's comment, there are actually three dominant hyperscale cloud providers in the U.S. and globally. Um, Google Cloud, Amazon Web Services, and Microsoft Azure. There's also Alibaba Cloud. I suspect there'll be a different point of view about that. But there clearly is some hesitancy by Western, uh, we Western uh, financial services firms to use Alibaba for a, a variety of reasons. Um, the cloud basically allows traditional businesses to do what they do best and not run data centers. And that has been a large part of financial services for the last several decades is to run data centers. The same way they shouldn't be running cafeterias, they shouldn't be running data centers. That's what we do. Um, beyond that, it also allows, we don't run, caf we run really great cafeterias, but we also run data centers, sorry. <laughs> it didn't come out quite the way I wanted it to. But the cloud also allows disruptors and challenges to get to market relatively quickly. 
um, with, new, with a new business model that are having to raise funds up front for significant capital expenditures. So second, what's the uh, intersection? Oh, so just a, another version of this slide just to see, to show you where we are. So second, what's the intersection of cloud and financial services? Um, as Bill Gates observed 25 years ago, we need banking, but we don't need banks anymore. Um, so financial services providers uh, face challenges with customers demanding more, uh, market forces in constant flux, mounting, uh, mounting regulatory and risk burdens, and legacy IT and high costs. Um, as you've heard before, customer expectations are changing. Customers expect to, uh, customers expect uh, the always on seamless personalized services from financial services providers now. Um, and the industry bifurcates on the one hand between traditional financial services providers, banks, broker dealers, asset managers, insurers, data providers, and on the other hand, the cloud natives um, across many of the same sub-segments. Sub the traditional providers are in many cases the result of mergers and acquisitions, resulting in balkanized data systems and, uh, and or have in the post-2008 period underinvested in technology and data management. Um, as PwC noted, um, financial services institutions have often grown through acquisition, operating with relatively static products and geography. Geographies, typically these IT operating models just are not nimble enough to support where things are headed. Because of the cloud, the disruptors, the cloud natives have been unencumbered by data architecture and hardware challenges that uh, incumbents have confronted. That said, by and large, the, the disruptors and the cloud natives really haven't functioned at this, the massive scale the traditional, as, uh, the traditional financial services providers have. So third, what are the opportunities? Um, cloud computing uh, converts what, is typically, what has classically been a capital expense into an operating expense and fundamentally shifting organizational spend decisions. Um, the implications of the shift are the ability to scale up much more quickly, the ability to provision for peak capacity, uh, the ability to stand up a development environment, all of which creates an environment for innovation, particularly in allowing for the use of artificial intelligence, which generally requires a massively scaled data environment. And more to the point, artificial intelligence will no longer be the unique domain of a cloistered group of data scientists. All my favorite people next, Rupert Murdoch. Um, as Rupert Murdoch noted, the world is changing. Big will not beat small anymore, it will be the fast beating the slow. Moreover, because of the scale of the hyperscale cloud providers, there's greater security. will match um, any, any financial services provider security against Google's. Um, and greater resiliency, the ability to fail over to uh, any of a, of a cloud service provider's data centers. And what do artificial intelligence and machine learning herald for financial services? Um, Again, PwC noted financial institutions still struggle to extract meaningful information and use it for good business decisions. By some estimates, businesses use only 0.5% of available data. Um, just by way of, ex this is uh, our CEO, as machine learning is transformative. Then these are machine learning um, in financial services. And I'm not going to read the slide, but there's a whole variety of places where machine learning can touch all the competencies that exist in financial services providers, whether it's in trading, sales, ops, compliance, risk management, and payments, et cetera. Um, so uh, fourth and finally, what are the challenges? Um, we're very much of the view that the financial services industry is poised for liftoff in the cloud. Um, that said, cloud adoption in traditional financial services providers, particularly in the US, has lagged. Um, the uh, financial, financial services represents uh, 1.5 trillion of U.S. gross product. Uh, we think that now there's 12.1 billion of spend in uh, financial services in the cloud in the U.S. Um, we see it go into 23.9 billion by 2021. And 61% of respondents, um, survey respondents said cloud strategy is only formative in their organization. Um, we view uh, the largest single vertical in, in, in the cloud as being financial services. It's a market opportunity that exceeds over $200 billion. 
So we see that as really the future of, of our business. Um, why has the US, the US market been slow? Um, first, legacy technology commitments. Um, lots of investment in data centers with long, e either, either the, the, the uh, real estate or actually the, 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 um, the, the, the technology itself. Um, in two recent reports, one by the Bank of England and a second by the Association for Financial Markets Europe, is noted the greatest barriers to cloud adoption were legacy IT and data limitations, and those were ahead of le uh, legal and regulatory concerns. Um, second, the hesitancy by industry executives, um, both in terms of they know what they know and they're comfortable with what they can physically put their hands on, but also who wants to be the CEO who has to explain um, a cloud data breach? Because there will be cloud data breaches, much like there are data breaches on-prem, but somehow the cloud is viewed as different even though greater security, greater resiliency. Um, and also internal IT, because if you're an IT leader at a financial services provider, um, you currently have this mass that you own, and now you're gonna be managing somebody else's mass. <laughs> Um, uh, third is regulatory reluctance. Um, much like executives, regulators like the idea that there's something that they know and understand and it's just classically what they've seen and done. Um, for us though, we took a, a great bit of, a great uh, deal of comfort um, in the interagency release last December around the use of artificial intelligence um, in dealing with financial crime because we, um, we do see that as a real, uh, a real focus for, uh, for cloud and artificial intelligence. Um, for the value of pow and power of the cloud to be recognized by financial services firms, it can't be lift and shift. You can't take a balkanized, corrupted data environment and move it in, and many, many applications and simply move it to the cloud. There's a huge amount of data um, remediation that has to be done before the cloud can be effectively used by institutions. Um, in cl closing, um, it's important not to complete the challenges that would be present whether it's an on-prem environment or a cloud environment. As I said earlier, a data breach is a data breach is a data breach. An outage is an outage is an outage. There are unique challenges to the cloud that result from hosting multiple financial services providers on a single cloud whether it be concentration risk. And concentration risk was initially about having a single provider on a single cloud, and most financial services providers now understand they need a multi-cloud strategy because no one wants to be hostage to a single cloud provider. Um, but now there is, with the move to the cloud, there are multiple um, financial service providers on a single cloud at a given time. And a cloud outage can have more profound impact on, on, on the markets. Um, the, another variation is vendor lock-in, exit from a cloud provider, and the inconsistent regulatory dire uh, directives that result from balkanized regulatory environment, informed by, in no small part by data residency requirements, which are political in origin, and a regulatory scheme that in large part still looks to the 1960s to the early 2000s for its touchstones, which Professor Scott will take those on in his observations. Um, one last note, um, as many of you may have read, Google recently announced we'd achieved the first quantum supremacy milestone. Our 54 qubit Sycamore processor was able to perform a calculation in 200 seconds that would have taken the world's most powerful supercomputer 10,000 years. Um, quantum computing will render all current encryption protocols meaningless. Um, that said, um, we're a decade or, or more away from the commercial adoption of co quantum computing, so I'll be back here in 10 years. We'll talk about that. But so no need to lose sleep over it just quite now. So thank you all very much. Good morning. Um, you know, as I sit here listening to this um, discussion of technology, couldn't help thinking back to the beginning of my career uh, in law around 1976, 77. Uh, first thing I ever did 
was work on the revision of our legal structure to accommodate electronic funds transfer. Okay. So sitting here with the cloud in 2019 is sort of like a repeat of my earlier experience. So um, in July 2019, uh, the program on international financial systems, which I direct, released a report on cloud computing in the financial sector, a global perspective, which provides background on cloud use in the financial sector, reviews existing regulatory frameworks with a focus on the United States and the European <coughs> Union, but some other countries as well, and recommends very modest improvements in those frameworks. And my remarks are based on that report. Financial regulators have issued guidance, usually based on their pre-existing framework for outsourcing by financial institutions to third-party service providers. And these, this guidance addresses cloud use by financial institutions as well. In the United States, for example, the Federal Financial Institution Examination Council, FIFIAC, an interagency body of U.S. bank regulators has issued general guidelines for outsourcing to, to technology service providers as well as specific guidance on cloud computing. Outsourcing guidelines issued by these regulators sir, uh, share several common features. For one, regulatory expectations usually vary based on the importance of the function moved to the cloud. Regulators look to whether a function's failure would materially impair a financial institution's regulatory obligations. And I also look at whether it would impair the financial performance of that institution or its business uh, or its ability to continue offering business uh, services. Regulators typically require that before moving to the cloud, financial institutions undertake a risk assessment of the cloud provider and the particular cloud services that they will use. In addition, regulators often require that financial institutions notify regulators before outsourcing to a cloud provider, especially when the outsourcing relates to material functions. Some jurisdictions, such as South Korea, the only one I could find, require regulatory approval for certain cloud functions by financial institutions. Um, now, once you go to the cloud, that's not the end. Um, there are ongoing obligations. Mandatory risk assessment continues after a financial institution migrates to the cloud. Regulators generally require that financial institutions audit their cloud providers. Many regulators also demand that the financial institution obtain certain information and access rights from its cloud provider, either for the financial institution itself its supervisor, or both. Some jurisdictions regulators require that the audits be performed by internal or external auditors of the financial institution. FIFIAC recommends that banking institutions use external auditors with expertise in cloud environments to evaluate cloud providers' controls. Other regulators allow financial institutions to rely on the cloud provider's auditor so long as the auditor complies with recognized auditing standards. A few regulators, which I'll come back to, including the European Banking Authority, authorize community audits in which a group of financial institutions using the same cloud combine together to perform the audit. Um, so regulators also set substantive requirements regarding the security of financial institutions' data that is on the cloud. FIFIAC, for example, requires that banking institutions ensure that their service providers' physical and data security standards are sufficient to meet their legal and commercial requirements and that outsourcing agreements specifically address the service provider's responsibility for security and confidentiality. Regulators also expect financial institutions to take privacy into account, in some cases requiring higher levels of security for personal data that resides on the cloud. In the European context, both financial institutions and cloud providers are subject to the General Data Protection Regulation of the European Union, 
which imposes restrictions on the storage and use of personal data. Many jurisdictions impose limits on how a financial institution's data can be used by a cloud provider. The 50th guidelines mandate that banking institutions forbid cloud providers from using or disclosing their data except as necessary to or consistent with provision of the relevant services. And one could have a long discussion about what that means. Um, some jurisdictions impose restrictions on the use of cross-border cloud services. In the United States, FIFIA does not restrict the transfer of data on, a cloud, on the cloud to a non-US jurisdiction, but requires that banking institutions understand the applicability of laws in a cloud provider's host country and their ability to control access to their data in that country. Other jurisdictions require that financial institutions notify their customers and or consult with regulators before transferring data to another jurisdiction. And some jurisdictions, such as China, prohibit outright the transfer of certain data outside the financial institution's home jurisdiction. Regulators generally require that financial institutions monitor their cloud providers' resilience and plan for service disruptions and other contingencies. An important aspect of contingency planning is the ability to terminate a cloud service relationship without disrupting material functions. Several regulators mandate that financial institutions set specific resiliency targets in their cloud service agreements. Now, I would like to turn to some modest suggestions for improvements in the regulatory approach. The cloud allows computing resources to be shared by a cloud provider's many users. Regulatory frameworks developed for traditional third-party outsourcing, which contemplate a one-to-one -one provider customer relationship, are ill-suited to that shared model of the cloud. Traditional frameworks place the onus of risk management on individual financial institutions, but this is inefficient and can increase security risk. Monitoring by the marginal financial institution does little to increase overall cloud security, and it can require access to the cloud provider in a manner that exposes one institution's information to another. In addition, cloud infrastructure is shared by customers located in different jurisdictions, each subject to its own disparate regulatory requirements, and most individual financial institutions are not well suited to assessing potential industry level risk from cloud use. So generally, I believe that financial regulators should, one, streamline the, digital, the diligence and monitoring process by clarifying expectations for audits of cloud providers. Two, improve cross-border coordination between regulators. And third, monitor potential industry-level risks posed by widespread cloud adoption. I'll leave my remaining time just drill down a little on each of these points. So. Um, Community audits, which I touched on before. Presently, most regulators expect that each financial institution will conduct its own audit of the cloud provider, even when the same provider serves multiple institutions. Community audits, where financial institutions conduct audits with other institutions that share the same cloud provider, would eliminate the redundancies and vulnerabilities created by duplicative monitoring not just redundancies, but vulnerabilities. They could also provide a forum for financial institutions to identify areas of common concern. Several financial supervisors, supervisors, including the European Banking Authority, have already acknowledged the value of the community audit approach, and I would recommend that U.S. regulators consider doing so as well. Second, with respect to cross-border regulatory coordination, to ensure consistency and predictability for financial institutions and cloud providers faced with an array of different sovereign, sovereign regulatory regimes, regulators should seek consensus, always difficult, around shared principles for regulating cloud use by financial institutions. 
It is important for those principles to be adaptable for jurisdictions with different levels of technological and financial maturity. Stimulating such cooperation should be a priority of the Bank for International Settlements and FSB. Third, um, as financial institutions migrate their core functions to the cloud, some uh, this is sort of the systemic risk issue here. As financial institutions migrate their core functions to the cloud, some, regulatory, some regulators have identified cloud providers as themselves potential sources of systemic risk. Now this is currently not realistic. According to the International Data Corporation, in 2018, uh, total worldwide IT spending and financial services was $450 billion, while, while worldwide spending on public cloud and financial services was $48 billion. In other words, financial institutions spent just about 10% of their overall IT budget on cloud services. And we've already heard from uh, Stuart about the low use of the cloud, which he regrets. Um, but the point is, at the moment, we don't have a systemic problem because we don't have uh, as much cloud use as we might. It appears that financial institutions still mostly rely on in-house technology infrastructure, especially for their core operations. However, if high reliance were to emerge, along with the, this is sort of like the problem of digital. It's small now, but it could become greater. However, if high reliance were to emerge, along with the current high degree of concentration among cloud providers, which there is, then an operational failure or cyber incident at a dominant provider could disrupt the activities of multiple financial institutions. This is a concern. Uh, accordingly, regulators should continue to monitor potential industry level risks arising from wider spread cloud use. And I think they should also consider requiring cloud users to back up their use of one cloud with another cloud, just the way data storage today of an individual institution is backed up at different locations. Thank you very much. I'm actually a little embarrassed now because we had this introduction about uh, how beggars are using QR codes. I promise you this is not the tip jar for this talk. <laughs> it will just, uh, it will open up my author page at the Peterson Institute so you can see my other works. I'm gonna talk about the revolutionary change that's happened in China as a result of big tech companies entering financial services, which has been nothing short of revolutionary. We started off with the image on the top right, which is people standing in line at banks. It's kind of like being in the DMV in the US. You take a number, you sit there and wait in this dusty hall, and some you know, indifferent teller maybe uh, gives you some services. The financial system was quite backwards. We didn't have basic financial infrastructure like uh, interbank payments, for example. You couldn't use a debit card from in Shanghai that was issued in Beijing until around 2002. Uh, for all, this entire period, there were heavy restrictions on financial services providers. The incumbent banks, which were almost all owned by the state, they pretty much lent to the state and state companies and ignored regular consumers. There was an undersupply of financial services both in the payment side and in uh, lending and investment. Today, China is the world's fintech leader. You saw the image on the bottom right. That's actually a tip jar trying to, uh, to get money because people don't carry cash anymore. Uh, China fintech is mainly characterized by what, what are called super apps. This is Alipay and WeChat Pay, China's largest e-commerce company and uh, social and gaming company that have begun to move into financial services and provide just about everything you could imagine from hailing, hailing a cab, getting an Uber, or getting uh, a shared bike, buying things online, chatting with people, uh, ordering at a restaurant, and investing in just about anything else in financial services. And hundreds of millions of Chinese people now have easy access to credit that would have been impossible before. Chinese banks pretty much skipped credit cards and 
very few people had them in the past. They would have to go to these informal loan shark and these kind of lenders. Uh, this is an image of uh, my Alipay app. You can see just the wide variety from travel and uh, investment to other functions uh, all in one application. It's almost like the operating system for your phone. You don't need to change apps. Uh, the reason this has happened is because tech companies have become financial giants. They start off with payments simply because the payments infrastructure in China was terrible at the time. If you were a gaming company and you wanted somebody to buy an item in your game for a couple RMB, you know, equivalent of a, of a dollar or two, no one's going to walk into the bank and send a wire. And very few people at that time had debit cards or credit cards. There was no way to do it. So they built their own payment system. And Alibaba, Alibaba did the same thing because they didn't have credit card chargebacks in China. So if you bought something online and it never came, there was no recourse for you. They created an escrow system which sat in the middle. Now these two systems handle about 25 times, each of them are about 25 times PayPal's global volume only in China. And they each have about 700 million users and have begun to expand abroad as well. Starting in 2013, they expanded into offline payments as well. This is the famous QR codes. Uh, and they also issued uh, a money market fund, which for a while was the largest money market fund in the entire world and, and became so in only a few short years. This allowed people to take their unused wallet, digital wallet balances and invest them and get interest instead. They've also bought asset management companies and since 2015 they now own banks and provide credit through a network of small loan companies. They provide credit scores. They provide virtual credit cards, which consumers use. It's pretty much like how you use a credit card if you added it to, to Apple Wallet, for example, um, but no plastic cards. So China's tech companies, the largest tech companies, are now gigantic financial services conglomerates. Just to give you a sense of that, Ant Financial, which was carved out of Alibaba, the largest e-commerce company in China, is now worth about $150 billion itself, which is about two Goldman Sachs. Pretty incredible. The reason this has happened is that unlike in the United States where tech firms have had to be very careful about entering into the United States for reasons related to Bank Holding Company Act and other regulations, the Chinese government encouraged big tech companies to enter into finance. At the beginning, around 2005, the central bank decided not to regulate the online payment space and instead allowed these companies to pretty much do whatever they wanted as long as it didn't break whatever informal line the central bank set of what was possible. That gave them an enormous amount of flexibility to see how the market would develop and what risks would occur when things were really small uh, and then only regulate later when it became big. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes from uh, Zhou Xiaochuan, who was the governor of the People's Bank of China, the central bank, through much of the period when fintech took off uh, from the 2000s all the way until the mid 2010s, and he's uh, outlining something which would sound absolutely crazy in the United States. He's saying, we have activities that required financial licenses, uh, but if a big tech company wants to come in and do it in a new way, we're not actually going to make them get that license. We're going to wait and watch and see what happens and eventually design a new regulatory system which works really well. We know how, for example, fintech charters have come into an enormous amount of skepticism in the United States. This kind of flexibility has definitely not occurred here. Uh, but of course, the traditional financial institutions in China remained heavily constrained. And that actually allowed fintech to become even bigger because their competition was constrained and they could move in with, with an uh, explicitly unlevel playing field. The reason this w they were successful uh, is not because they had some unique special technology that, uh, that no one else had or that were more sophisticated. It's actually quite basic. A lot of people had mobile phones. Uh, and they were easily able to access cheap data from that. And the QR codes were ingenious in many ways because a small business could just use their personal cell phone to accept payments without investing in any POS or even any uh, software. They could just use their personal wallet account to receive payments. Whether or not they actually report that on their taxes is another thing. Uh, the, the core innovation is the business model which fused everything together and took advantage of the backwardness of China where they could leapfrog right from cash into mobile payments, skipping the credit card stage. Uh, many of these ideas were actually imported from abroad and just used better in China. One example is a payment company offering a money market fund. PayPal did it, but interest rates were so low in the United States that it failed. Uh, in China, this helped actually dismantle some financial repression because there were great interest rates to be achieved in the money markets. It's more like money market funds in the 1970s in the US. 
The Japanese actually invented QR codes to track uh, inventory. This is a, a Toyota subsidiary, but, uh, but and the first example of its use in payments that I could find was actually Starbucks. But uh, China then has now used it, and there's, it's everywhere. And Alipay started in a very low-tech way. It was, uh, you, you had to fax your confirmation slip f from the bank that you had used to send money to your Alipay wallet, and then they would manually confirm that. Now this can handle about 250,000 transactions per second, and there's very little human <coughs> involvement. Uh, the political economy is also key. I feel like in many discussions around fintech around the world, we don't talk enough about the politics behind it, where big incumbents are often able to block uh, disrupt, potential disruption, hiding behind talking about the financial risks, but actually it's really about a lack of competition. Uh, the, in China, they protected from foreign competition the fintech companies. That was actually illegal under the World Trade Organization, and the US uh, has complained about this for a long time. But they did not prohibit the new tech companies from competing against powerful incumbent financial services providers. That was critical to the success of fintech in China. And that comes partially because these weren't some scrappy startups with no connections. These were companies that were connected to enormously powerful business moguls who had their own power networks in China. Uh, it's not all positive, though. I want to talk about some of the regulatory issues that the central bank in China and other regulators are dealing with that I think we're going to deal with as more technology firms enter financial services, but they're more urgent in China. The first is the data islands problem. So generally in, in finance, we know we have uh, credit bureaus so that a lot of the positive and negative information is shared, which allows lenders to compete and people's credit histories to be portable. But if you're using this alternative data, which is only used in a proprietary manner in one company, that's not shared. So you lose some of that sharing, sharing uh, benefit. And if you look at 1033 of, of Dodd-Frank or PSD2, much of this involves uh, data flows from one direction, from the banks to other providers, not from those other providers back to the banks. So that might create an unlevel playing field. It's been extremely difficult for the regulators in China to get them to share this data. Uh, the second is how to overcome political opposition to effective regulation. There have been multiple times when China's big tech companies have, have managed to neuter regulation from the central bank that would have made payments more secure, but they had the political power to stop it, and that's a big concern. The third is in competition. So in China, in the, at least in the short term, these powerful tech companies entering finance was extremely beneficial for bringing competition to the financial sector and really helped push the incumbent banks to start doing things like adopting the cloud, maybe more fa faster than we're doing here, and beginning to actually focus on consumer lending and small business lending. But in the long term, we have to wonder whether having these gigantic conglomerates in both finance and tech find it find themselves so dominant that no one can compete in either of these other fields. Maybe the financial firms without the tech advantages can't compete in that sector, and the tech firms that might be bringing innovation that don't have the financial advantages can't compete, and then we end up with a, a less innovative financial system overall. And there's a sense in which all this cross uh, subsidization between them could lead to distortions in, in, in multiple markets. The fourth is how to regulate these complex conglomerates. These gigantic companies have uh, businesses that are interconnected with enormous quantity of related party transactions, both on the data side and the financial side, between banks and the tech side and all throughout financial services. It's, and at this point, no regulator really has an overall view of these companies, and that's quite worrying. And then finally, there's a geopolitical question. Currently, the international financial architecture is dominated by the United States. You know, American payment companies have been uh, the most successful abroad. Now we have Libra with uh, American company uh, Facebook potentially leading to a large role in international finance. And the Chinese are really worried about this because they don't want to see Facebook make it impossible for their big tech, uh, fintech companies to expand abroad. And they don't want the US and its companies to be able to dominate the future of payments. That's it. Thank you. I am going to uh, to start with a couple of questions, and then we are going to open to the floor. So just uh, 
you're still fresh. Uh, we heard about uh, China, and we also have uh, heard that there is uh, this uh, social credit score in China that Alibaba creates for everybody. So people can just watch score on their phone, <laughs> changes every, um, every hour. How does that, is that, you said data is not shared, but it seems like that score, it's a little bit like Equifax score or trans, right, TransUnion score, how does that work? Uh, it's a little bit like that. So uh, this, I there are actually two separate things. One is the social credit system, which has every all the Western media freaking out about it, its Orwellian nature, which it might be. But that at this point is separate from the numerical score, which is provided by Ant Financial. That's a lot of like e-commerce data, payments data, how you use the sharing economy. You know, if you get a bike, uh, get a shared bike, and if you th like, throw it into a, a canal in Beijing, it's going to lower your score, that kind of thing. That's not actually used much for lending in China. The central bank found that all that alternative data, which has been touted, and people love to talk about how big data is amazing and AI is amazing for underwriting, but it, it turned out that, uh, that this system and others that were designed by big tech companies were actually quite inconsistent across consumers, partially because one company has a lot of data on one consumer, another has on, on another. So it's not actually used very much. Uh, they've, they've found that actually the more traditional credit histories, especially that they're able to generate by starting off with really small loans uh, of, out of a very short-term nature, like these virtual credit cards, can very quickly establish a credit history which allows you to lend to somebody. And then on the small business side, they're very similar to Square in that they are controlling the payment system. They can see the flows in and out. They can see what people are buying and if they're happy and thus can provide credit at much cheaper and, uh, and better than the banks would ever be able to provide because of their real-time monitoring. And also they have a big stick, which is that you know if you don't pay back, they can lower your rating in the e-commerce store and nobody goes to like page 10 of the uh, Amazon listings, right? So, so you really have a strong incentive to pay that back. Uh, so, again, not a Google advertisement, um, but we do have this product called Anthos, which we've just introduced, which is the first operating plane that allows you to switch between clouds. Um, it is not yet instantaneous. It's not yet broadly adopted. Um, it okay. is, I don't know that there'll ever be, the, the concept of there being, it failed now and 30 seconds later you're now on a different cloud, moving massive amounts of data is probably not the right way to look at it. The better way to look at it is that we all the cloud providers have multiple data centers. And so we just had this conversation with senior, um, senior US regulators, the idea of the cloud going down. Um, if the cloud goes down, um, we have hit the nuclear holocaust and it is the end of the world. A single cloud will, ne will never go down in all of its manifestations because we all have multiple da data centers to fail over to. Um, the challenge may be more regulatory as Professor Scott reflected, the idea that there's these resi data residency requirements that mean that don't allow you to move data up between jurisdictions. But there, so two things. One, there will be easier movement of data between the clouds in years to come. It will likely never be instantaneous, but in the world of moving data, there's certainly the capacity to move data between data centers within a given cloud and the real constraint is probably um, legal and regulatory in terms of the limitations on moving data outside of jurisdictions and not an issue here in the states, as was noted. So I think there are really two different issues here, um, backup between clouds and backup between cloud providers. So um, I think the relatively easier problem is the first. Um, if one of Google's clouds goes down, I think 
it's relatively easy, it may not be instantaneous, mm -hmm. to shift that to another Google Cloud, certainly in the same jurisdiction, if um, there was a jurisdiction. So just so we get the, the terminology right, we only have one cloud, well, we have multiple data centers, data centers within, within one cloud. Okay, sorry. That, that's good, so to another data center. Uh, a different issue is uh, Google goes down and all of its data centers go down. Okay. Uh, should we want to have an alternative cloud provider to which this service could be switched? Um, right. and but the infrastructure has to match, is it? Uh, how does that work? Well, I'm not sure how it would work. Uh, Stuart might be uh, much better to explain that to me, but I think that the basic principle is backup, okay, and alternatives. And um, I think, again, this isn't a near-term problem because of the level of cloud use. But as cloud use ex increases, and by the way, today, the dominant cloud provider for financial services, sorry, Stuart, is Amazon, not Google. So uh, right now, the problem might be uh, more difficult because Google's extents of uh, services may not be at the level of Amazon's to accommodate this sort of switch from one cloud provider to another. These are just problems to worry about in the future as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so one more question for you then. Um, so we, we talk about disruption, financial stability concerns. What about data security? We have seen like Cap One, for example, with AWS, that was uh, the data breach in July this year. Does that confirm that this con concern is really a big problem? <laughs> well, I, I don't think. Like the AWS. I, I, I don't think so. Um, Stuart will be happy with my answer. Um, so, um, the best we can tell is that uh, how the hacker got access to the cloud uh, was because of the lacks of Capital One's own data security systems. Okay. So, um, and. I don't think the problem would have been any different if Capital One had insourced its data to its own data center, okay? A hacker could get access to that data center because of the lack of security of Capital One, okay? Um, now, I, I think, uh, Jalop, when you were previewing this question, you observed, and I didn't know this, that the hacker had previously worked for Amazon raising the question uh, sort of was this sort of hacker able to do this because he knew the Amazon systems or the Amazon web. I don't think there's any evidence of this. Um, he, w he was a techie, okay? He happened to have worked for Amazon, but the way he got access to the system was because of the, the failures of the systems of Capital One. My general point on this is on a data security privacy issue. Um, and Stuart made this point, and I couldn't agree with it more. Um, the providers like Google and Amazon's technology to protect data and security is superior, okay, to that of financial institutions. So Capital One is better having its data, or anybody, I think, at a cloud with this kind of sophistication for privacy and data protection than they would be in their own systems. That's not to say we don't have the systemic risk issue which we previously discussed. Okay, just one more, one question for Lou. Uh, so you mentioned that Square, 77% uh, of uh, borrowers are first time uh, borrower, uh, people who, who get the loan for the first time. And at the same time, it seems like you are le making loans to people who don't have uh, good credit history, uh, uh, thin credit file, but at the same time your loss is 4%. How, how did you do that? Uh, again, I think, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, that we, we don't look at past activities that have, uh, I mean, we don't rely on FICO, for example. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't rely on that as a decision-making uh, uh, mode. What we look at is really the fundamentals of the business today in real time and how healthy is their processing, 
how steady is it, how volatile is it, how diverse it is, is there concentrations in, th in the payments they receive. And so from that data, uh, and uh, again, it's, it's uh, very current and, and updates every day, uh, every minute of every day, we are able to feel like the, the person or the seller really understands their business and we can lend to them uh, in a way that one, we never want to be uh, you know, uh, onerous in, in taking a position with them. We never want to be a payday lender, for example. We want to lend them an amount of, uh, an amount of money and, and a hold rate, and, uh, and I talk about the hold rate of what we would hold from each transaction they have of say 10 to 14%. That allows them to handle uh, the rest of their business and not pay in a bullet situation where they, they would have to, uh, on a given day, pay all of their proceeds to, uh, to fund their loan. That's why I think we're successful in taking uh, that sliver, that hold rate on a daily basis without them even thinking about it and then having them run their business uh, and not thinking about their lending situation. And, and that's how we've been successful, I believe. So that's interesting because I think because you are only using your own alternative data from that is internal, correct. your own proprietary data yep. through your platform. And that's not the whole story about someone's life because they might be doing something else while other lenders actually use, fint fintech lenders actually use data, transaction, bank transaction data. So they know everything about all the banks and credit card and everything, but somehow you actually are able to uh, achieve a lower loss rate. That's well, I, uh, again, I think when you have, uh, I mean, there's a lot of good lenders out there and, and uh, marketplace lenders that have different uh, ways to lend. But I, I think that we have felt that we have the detail and the level of payment detail that uh, that makes our program successful, and that is really through the machine learning and the AI uh, to to look at the time of day of payment. Uh, uh, is it is it within the storefront, and and all of those uh, you know geolocation type uh, modes help us determine uh, you know uh, do they receive a hundred payments of a dollar each, or do they receive one payment of a thousand dollars? It it helps us really understand, and and while those other lenders have access to a wider array of uh, of bank statements or whatever they may pull uh, credit scores, uh, when they see something from Square on a on a bank statement, it just says two thousand dollars they got from Square. Uh, when we look at that payment, we, we know every underlying transaction and the payment vehicle that was used to pay that. And, and so that's where we have felt like we've been successful. Sounds good. Uh, yes. Yes, we are re ready for questions. Uh, there's one question in the back. Uh, you want to be next? Thank you. Uh, Diego Zuraga from the Cato Institute. Um, thank you all for the fascinating presentations. I was wondering if Martin could expand on the People's Bank of China's handling of payment companies, non-bank payment companies float, and those companies' relationships with Chinese banks, uh, and how that might relate to tech companies' own efforts overseas uh, to have their own securities and how they would handle interest income uh, to facilitate their own payments provision. Thanks. Sure, that's a great question. So initially, the way that the payments uh, company, the non-bank non payments companies in China ran things was pretty much like being what the PBSC has since called being a second central bank. So they opened up an account with all of the individual banks in many of the individual cities, and they had enormous bargaining power because they had a lot of the money flowing in and the access to a lot of a lot of that float, which they could then bid up for a high interest rate. But starting in 2017, the central bank said, we don't like that idea, and has forced them since to put 100% of the float 
into the uh, into a special account that is non-interest bearing at the central bank. Part of that is because some of the smaller payment companies were embezzling the money or putting you know really uh, putting it into ris- risky investments to try and make money. But uh, but it's taken billions in revenue away from the big tech companies. On the other side, what's happened is instead of routing the money between banks, effectively doing interbank payments within the Alipay or Tencent network, the central bank has created a separate clearing system which uh, which has non-banks and banks together in the same system and then just one single window for each of them with standardized terms and that's taken away a lot of the power of the of the big tech companies because they have to pay fees to this thing that's run in effect by the central bank although they have a little bit of clearance in that when uh, when it comes to going abroad uh, I'm not so sure. Uh, generally, they've gone abroad uh, on the backs of Chinese tourists. You know, you can go to a Walgreens in the United States and pay with Alipay, for example. Most first data POS machines uh, can, uh, even if the merchant doesn't know it, can accept Alipay with about two clicks, which is quite extraordinary. But all of the that money is going on American credit card company rails. It's not a separate system. They're not actually chi- Chinese firms entering into our payment system. It's that you know the U- the U.S. merchant gets that in dollars, and then eventually you know it gets pulled out of the Chinese account uh, in China. Yeah, Bob. Yeah, um, Bob Hunt with the Consumer Finance Institute here at the Philadelphia Fed, and this um, this is a great segue from the last question, but also a really interesting panel to pose uh, this question. So we got an hour into this conference, and we've already been talking about. Um, two new real-time gross settlement payment systems being developed in the U.S., and at the same time, this discussion of um, digital currencies as a, as a new form of payment. And I'm, I'm wondering what the perspective of the panel is about these directions for uh, future payments or possibly a third direction that we haven't brought up yet, especially in the context of what I just heard about the way that China is clearing and settling these online payments. So China is really trying to take the lead in uh, issuing a central bank digital currency. That's both a domestic uh, goal and also an international one. They're, uh, as I alluded to, they're really unhappy with the way that the U.S. dominates the global payment system and the role of the dollar. And there's some talk about using a uh, central bank digital currency to boost the international expansion of the renminbi. For now, I'm very, very skeptical about this, despite all the alarmism down in in Washington that I see, because no other country has a central bank digital currency, so I don't see what it's going to plug into. Uh, So far, if you look at systems like Bitcoin, they handle, what, seven transactions per second. Uh, Visa is like 65,000, Alipay is like 250,000, so uh, these systems don't tend to be very, uh, work very well. I mean, there is a, Project Stella going on between the ECB and the Bank of Canada, which is looking at trying to go directly between central banks using uh, using blockchain and digital currency to to settle. But all of these are in pretty preliminary stages at the moment. So I would say that's going to take a a long time before we really know whether any of this will actually be a convincing alternative architecture to what exists because you have to have hedging instruments, you have to have enormous amounts of liquidity, you have to have these enormous network effects which the U.S. benefits from. So I think something the Chinese have has to be much better that to, to be able to supplant the role of the U.S. dollar. So um, I would just add to that that the reason people are not using the existing Chinese currency largely has to do with capital controls. All right, so which the Chinese are not about to get rid of anytime soon. Uh, so anybody holding this currency has much less uh, alternative to invest it than holding a dollar in which we have free markets. So just converting to taking their currency and making it digital is not going to be some silver bullet uh, for uh, you know having uh, Chinese digital be more attractive than the U.S. dollar. Uh, hi, Peter Renton, Lend at FinTech. I actually had a question about digital currency as well, but maybe um, uh, really directed at you, Martin. Um, the I, I've read that the, the, the currency may even launch this month. I mean, is that are, are you hearing that it's imminent that China, the Chinese government are going to be launching their digital currency? And and I guess 
I mean, China having a lot more control over uh, over their economy, as just pointed out, is this something that's going to be mandated um, adoption for everybody? What, what, what's your thoughts on how it's going to roll out? So uh, Chinese policymakers are generally quite conservative in that they try a small-scale pilot before something big happens. The first successful mini-pilot was actually in uh, Uruguay, where they issued a central bank digital currency to individuals, and it was almost like trading digital banknotes, like you had to split a 20 into two tens, apparently, to actually be able to, to do that. I think the Chinese will start with a pilot probably early next year in Shenzhen. There was a lot made of Wu Changchun, who's the um, head of the Digital Currency Research Institute, saying it's almost ready, but he used one of those Chinese four-character phrases, which you know are like about the sage on the mountain and allow, allow a lot of space for, uh, <laughs> for ambiguity, because you really can't rush this. If you launch it and you have a double spend problem, like Bitcoin had, uh, you risk under undermining the entire financial system and the credibility of the central bank. It's not like you know some small side network that can be totally segregated. So I think, it, and there's also a lot of debate within the central bank about whether, how fast they should move on this and whether it should be used, say, in a bank or whether it should be issued more directly to consumers. I think there's a lot more to be hammered out. Any more questions? Yeah, hey, yeah, Larry. Uh, Larry Wall, uh, Research Department in Atlanta. Uh, questions for Stuart and for Hal, both related to cloud. Stuart made the good point that the cloud can't fail, at least the physical infrastructure, because it's spread across multiple locations. But those locations may share common software for the operating systems and communications and things like that. Uh, is that a risk? And if so, kind of how is that being mitigated? And for Hal, assume the cloud scaled up and exceeded uh, Stuart and his competitors' wildest dreams in financial services. Uh, but there was no change basically in the functions they're serving. They continue to operate like they are now. Is this something that the FSOC, could they at that stage be considered by the FSOC to be designated as financial market utilities or SIFIs? So, um, uh, so in terms of the infrastructure that supports them, um, I don't know that that's the case. Again, we have our own dedicated um, network that is, I think, fairly uh, very resilient and, and wouldn't suffer from that problem. But I don't know that for sure, and I guess I need to figure that out. So next time someone asks that question, I can answer it. Um, and, but the question, this question you addressed to, to Professor Scott is an interesting one too, because you do think about I is is regulation of the cloud when it comes to regulated industries on the horizon, and you'd think that thoughtful regulators would be contemplating that. Or again, right now the point's a great point. The, the, the adoption in the cloud in, f in financial services has been relatively small. The, there's, a, there's a trajectory towards it, um, there's momentum, but it's still our, uh, it's, it's our dream. Um, we look for the day when there is that broad adoption, although we do believe that at some point in the mid-20s, there will in fact be very broad adoption of the cloud, and that will be something that has to be taken very seriously. So, um, in terms of um, FSOC, and uh, as, as many of you know, FSOC has the power to designate non-financial uh, institutions as systemically important and then push them over to the Federal Reserve to be regulated. Uh, a number of industries, well, insurance was designated, a number of companies, um, but there's now zero in that place because they have either won court cases or where they uh, or FSOC has let them go. Uh, there was a, a big to-do about whether to designate asset management companies as uh, in this space. Uh, FSOC decided not to do so. Uh, but, you know, um, FSOC uh, has designated, can and has designated uh, certain uh, bank uh, facilities as uh, systemically important or people who service banks. Let me give you the... Um, the, the language that uh, uh, 
is required to designate. They can designate any person that manages or operates a multilateral system for the purpose of transferring, clearing, or settling payments, securities, or other financial transactions among financial institutions. So it's payments and clearing and settlement. It doesn't say cloud. So the outset uh, is a question of the scope, okay, of this statute as it's currently drafted. I think if they were to uh, designate um, Google or Amazon uh, because of their cloud services at this point, lawyers would raise a big question about their authority to do so. That's not to say that the statute couldn't be changed. Uh, not to say the statute shouldn't be changed, okay? In my view, if we were facing, you know, uh, comes back to the systemic risk issue we discussed previously, if use of cloud services by financial institutions were to increase dramatically, okay, I think we would then have uh, an important issue as to designation. I don't think, again, I don't, we're not there yet. This is something to think about in the future. Okay. Yes, Linda. Um, so I'm Professor Linda Allen at Zickland School of Business, and this is a question for Lou and I guess Martin as well regarding um, uh, the loans that are made by um, uh, Alibaba and uh, Square Capital. Are they funded by the entity, your firms, uh, the firms as well, or are they funded by outside institutions? That is, does Square have skin in the game in these loans, or are they, um, uh, do outside lenders uh, choose to fund the individual loans? Are they actual securities like uh, lending club issues and the like? So can you ex elaborate on that a little? Yeah, it's an important question. So uh, certainly Square does have skin in the game. And and what we do is that uh, these are whole loan sales. And uh, and we do have a number of investors uh, uh, that uh, have various backgrounds. And uh, I mean, we, we really see that by uh, having almost a lottery type system where they're not picking and choosing. Everybody in the system uh, that has agreed to purchase loans, including ourselves, goes, uh, goes in and is assigned the next loan and it, and it goes through that process. And so there's not a pick and choose type of an arrangement. And, and it is important that, that uh, they stay consistent and the underwriting uh, has, uh, has proved to be very consistent in the grades that we have have given it that that they would uh, each investor including us would get a cross section of those loans and so uh, yes we would definitely keep a piece of it and eat our own cooking if you will thank you okay so we I'll take one last question Christine um, I actually have two questions I'm sorry <laughs> um, <laughs> one I'd be very curious to know whether or not Google is going to be uh, competing with the existing core banking services Oh, core banking system, um, the four companies, or whether or not you're going to be a complement to them, I guess. And two, I'd be very interested to know whether or not Square Capital is, has observed a material change in the small businesses' working capital investment as a result of the existence of the loans. Okay, so I, th I don't know whether you missed the beginning remarks I made because my first comment was we are not going to compete with core banking, where we're there as a service provider to financial services providers. And the Wall Street Journal notwithstanding, um, we, we are there to partner with banks and provide them a robust technology platform for their businesses. Is it, was, there a different, was there something different in the question you were asking? Because I'm not quite sure I understood it. It's funny. I, I, I don't. I apologize. I don't know. I, just yesterday, I came across Jack Henry. I don't know enough about Jack Henry's business model to tell you whether we're competing with them or not. I don't know what they do. Um, I just don't know. But if there's if there's something about the question, I'm just not understanding. I apologize. Uh, as far as uh, Square Capital and and does it make a difference uh, in, in the marketplace if I understand you, or, or it makes a difference. Uh, 
in, in the ability for uh, a small business to grow. Uh, what we have found is that uh, while I mentioned 77% of the borrowers that we have, it's the first time that they've ever been able to access capital at all. 90% uh, of the offers that we provide after the initial credit uh, is is uh, taken by our our customers, our sellers, because they have found that it is helpful in their uh, ability to, whether it's add staff, uh, buy inventory, uh, you know, uh, replace and 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 grow their their business. It has been you know very helpful for them. But I don't have. Uh, hard data to, to be able to tell you that in, in numbers, but it, uh, w we've had excellent response uh, from, our, uh, from our sellers because they've just never had access before. Okay, one quick short round. Just give everyone a chance to say a few final words. Anyone who wants to start <laughs> yeah. first. Always sunny in Philadelphia. Uh, no, no, no clouds. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, look, I, uh, Square is is really uh, uh, excited to to be a, a part of many millions of small businesses' success, and and the more that we can help uh, small businesses understand, and we can and we can provide analytics that can help them become better businesses, it only makes us grow stronger. Thank you. So I think I've said it a few times, but the, the future is the cloud. And the cloud is ultimately a, so across the entire spectrum of financial services, large and small, every aspect of the business, every aspect of financial service provision. And it's also an empowering device. Um, the AI that Lou has talked about, that's our core competency, and that can only be done in, in, in the cloud to really do it effectively, to really crunch massive amounts of data. So I think in five years time, the regulatory pieces will be sorted, the business elements will be sorted, there'll be ways to transfer data amongst the clouds. There really is, the, the, but no financial services provider should be heavily reliant on on-prem in five years from now. So I only have two words, go Patriots. I, I, yeah, I come from Boston, so give me a break. <laughs> so I, I would say we have to really worry about uh, the U.S. falling behind other countries in fintech. I was having a conversation with a Latin American investor yesterday who said a few years ago, all the companies he was investing in were saying, I want to be like uh, American fintech companies. We want to do marketplace lending or we want to be like Square or Stripe. And now all of them are saying we want to be like Ant Financial, we want to be like WeChat. The model for the way the rest of the world is going has shifted towards China very quickly in, in fintech. And that's something we should be really concerned about. Let's join me in thanking the speakers. <laughs>